Our friends in blue showed up at my garage in the form of two police officers in a patrol car. I secretly watched them from my place under the lift. It was unusual to see such happy police officers. Their faces became more serious as they approached me. They confirmed my identity and said they had bad news for me. Something happened to my wife in our house and she was in the hospital, but they couldn't go into detail. I tried to leave right away, but they stopped me, wanting some answers. Can you explain where you have been for the last three hours, sir? Yes, officer, I've been here all day. Just ask my two mechanics. Sorry, I actually snuck out for 10 minutes around 11 a.m. to get us coffee. One of the policemen came over to chat with Mike and Pete. Another wrote down which coffee shop I was at. Can you show me your car, sir? He asked. Of course, my truck is outside. I took him outside to my pride and joy. The thorough bastard calmed the interior, then opened the hood and felt the engine, cold as a stone. That's it, sir. You can go to the hospital. I had a look of concern on my face as the hospital staff member explained the extent of Kate's injuries, the fact that she had received a blood transfusion, and then informed me that she was now undergoing surgery. I thought it was very unprofessional of the doctor to half-smile the entire time he was talking to me. On leaving the hospital, I was intercepted by the same two policemen who were in the garage earlier. They wanted some more answers. We retired to the hospital cafeteria for some much-needed coffee. They wanted to know how my relationship with my wife was. I explained that we met and got married relatively late, eight years ago. Kate worked successfully as an attorney for a large local firm. She basically wanted to have children, but resisted my pressure until she was almost 40 years old because she wanted to establish herself in her job. They asked me why she was home on a weekday. I explained that Kate had quit her job a month ago to rest before her pregnancy, a sort of vacation before at least 10 years of domestic service. I then added in conclusion that I love my wife and we are doing well and are looking forward to having a baby. They asked me if I knew a certain John Barton. When I answered no and asked why they were asking, they avoided answering and walked away. I knew I could rely on my guys to lock the garage, so I went straight home. Two forensic scientists and one detective were searching the house. The detective introduced himself and explained what he knew. He then asked me the same questions as the previous officers, plus one new one. Can you explain why we found a few drops of blood in the downstairs toilet, sir? Sorry, I have no idea, detective. Now can I ask you something? It is clear that you are not treating this as an accident, and also that I am being treated as a suspect. Can you assure me that you are not concentrating on me as the only subject, but are also looking for the real culprit? You can rest assured, sir, that we have several lines of inquiry. My colleague is now talking to Mrs. Barton. Who is this John Barton I keep hearing about? Sorry, sir, I think it is inappropriate for me to comment. He and the CSIs then walked away, leaving me confused. I went upstairs to the master bedroom and looked CSIs then walked away leaving me confused. I went upstairs to the master bedroom and looked at the scene that was playing out. I would be really shocked if I was watching it for the first time. Earlier in the day around 10 a.m. at work, I started thinking about sex. There is nothing unusual about this. They say guys think about sex an average of 67 times per waking hour. Let me tell you that men who have been virtually cut off from their wives for a month can at least double that. Since Kate left work, Hour two, three times a week has dropped to almost zero. Kate was either in a bad mood, bored and depressed, or too tired. Personally, I thought it was because her normal life was almost over and she was just scared. Being a caring husband, I didn't want to put pressure on her. She will come out of her fear at her own pace. I knew that my life would change after having children, but I understood that her life would be turned upside down. I kept daydreaming about what our sex life was like in the early years of our marriage, anywhere, anytime, in any case. We made an effort to keep it fresh and new for as long as our imaginations continued to exist, and then slowly fell into the automatic mode that two long-term partners often fall into. I snapped out of my stupor. I knew what to do. Bring back spontaneity. Go home right now and have sex with Kate until you're unconscious. Okay, the decision has been made. It's time to get out and go home. I told Mick and Pete. 
I was going away for a while. Pete asked if I could take the car he had just finished servicing for a test drive. When I got home, I was disappointed to see an unfamiliar car in the driveway. Damn it, my friend's visit ruined my plans. I decided to go in anyway. Maybe my friend could be persuaded to leave and my plans could be saved. Without any suspicion or attempt to hide, I opened the front door. My hair immediately stood on end and I knew my marriage was over. The obvious sounds of ecstatic sexual activity literally thundered down the stairs. It was almost a reflex action to pull out the phone and start recording video. Whenever a client brought the car to the garage, I always took a quick video recording so that we wouldn't be accused of scratching it. With my heart pounding, I ran up the steps and peered through the bedroom door. Video camera at the ready. Yes, it was Kate. And yes, it was some guy I didn't recognize happily having her on our bed. Fighting the urge to pounce and kill, I turned away. I can honestly say that this was the hardest thing I have ever done in my life. My legs could no longer support me, and I collapsed on the floor right outside the door. Completely devastated, I was only dimly aware that they were reaching their peaks just around the corner. I don't know how long I stayed there, but gradually it dawned on me that all the sounds of their adultery had stopped and only conversations could be heard. It was just as bad and still tore me to the core. I knew I had to get out of earshot to give myself time to think. I instinctively knew that any reaction I made based on emotion would, at the very least, land him in the hospital and me in prison. I needed time to think. I quietly got up from the floor, tiptoed downstairs and collapsed on the sofa. Away from the sights, smells, and most of the sounds of betrayal, I was free from emotional distractions. I did what I knew best and came up with a plan. Get him out of the room and out of sight. Beat the crap out of him where there won't be too many bruises. The stomach should be in perfect order. Then throw him out the back door naked. Come back for her and throw her naked out the door. This should give them the right impression and give me complete freedom. Without bruises and witnesses, I hope I can avoid trial. Luckily, I had the perfect shock weapon in my workshop. Two years ago, I served in the Army Reserve National Guard, where my skills earned me the task of clearing the trucks we took back to base. That's where I found a small device that would now come in handy. Police call them stun grenadiers, slightly larger than a regular grenadier. They are basically a small canister with a lever pin ignition mechanism. They were specifically made for Hostigorusk and were designed to cause little physical damage so that they could be thrown into a room full of innocent people without any significant harm. However, the explosion is accompanied by a flash with a power of 8 million candles and a shock sound of 170 decibels. The flash alone can stun a person to the extreme for at least 5 seconds. My mind, driven by my newly acquired hatred, quickly formed the rest of the plan. I didn't want to ruin my house, so I couldn't just throw a grenade on the floor. I took out the device and quickly glued a short piece of rope to it, then put a loop on the end of the rope. Having thus prepared, I tipped it upstairs. As I got closer, I realized that secrecy was no longer necessary. I clearly heard men's moans coming from behind the bedroom door. Pausing only to pick up my phone from the floor outside the door where I had dropped it, I glanced around the doorframe. It was heard that the second round of sex was in full swing. My wife satisfied her lover by caressing his manhood below the waist. Having mentally rehearsed the sequence of events I had decided to do, I took a deep breath and took action. One step into the room, looped the end of the rope around the hook on the bottom of the light fixture, leaving the device hanging halfway to the floor. Pull out the pin, put it in your pocket, and walk out the door again pressing your fingers tightly to your ears and closing your eyes tightly. Even with my precautions, the effect was amazing. I clearly felt the shock wave and the bright reflected light through my eyelids. Following the plan, I jump into the room again, ready for action. This time it was my turn to be surprised. I don't know exactly what I expected to see, but it was nothing like the scene that appeared before me. Mr. Anonymous was lying on his back on the bed, and his manhood below the waist was clearly damaged. Either nature was extremely unkind to him, or something was missing. Kate lay on her back on the floor, her eyes blank, her mouth opening and closing like a fish out of water. 
Confused, I went back into the hall to think. My thoughts were soon interrupted by two unholy screams from the bedroom, followed by various bangs and slamming doors. I began to realize that I was in deep shit. My plan had failed. Once again, I peered around the doorframe at the scene of carnage. The guy rolled out of bed and curled up on the floor, holding his groan, screeching like a banshee. Kate was nowhere to be seen, but apparently she was in the bathroom. We need to remove the evidence. I returned to the room, looked around, and quickly found the detonator mechanism for the device, adding it to the rope. I couldn't find anything else, so I concluded that everything else had been destroyed. I headed to the bathroom very carefully. Kate was on her knees, vomiting into the toilet. I had no desire to go and help her, I just didn't care anymore. On my way to the door, I noticed something on the floor. I picked up a piece of flesh. It was warm and soft, and resembled the tip of a tongue. On the way to the front door, I went into the toilet on the first floor and flushed it. They wouldn't sew it back on. Trying not to squeal the tires, I rushed down the street, once again glad that we lived so far from the neighboring houses. Halfway to the garage, I dumped my pockets into a roadside trash can. Ten minutes later, I was back in the small garage that I called work. I called Pete and Mike, two dirty oil-stained guys who I call my employees and friends. They hurried to me, seeing that I was alarmed. Guys, I need you to be my alibi for the last 45 minutes. What do you say? Of course, boss was heard almost simultaneously. Well, before you agree so quickly, I must tell you that what I did is very serious. And once I explain to you what it is, you may not be so quick to answer. I don't know what I'll be charged with, but it could mean jail time. Before explaining this to them, I went into my office and threw on my dirty old overalls. I then walked over to the trash can and grabbed an oily rag, rubbing it into my face and hands. I didn't know when the police would show up here, but I expected them. The guys looked at me a little stunned. I briefly told them about recent events. Mike was the first to break. He tried to hold on for a good 15 seconds and then burst out laughing. This broke the ice for Pete, who soon joined Mike and me in uncontrollable hooting. It was a full five minutes before we all regained control, and with handshakes and promises of support, they returned to their oily engine bays. Over the next hour, spontaneous chuckles were heard from various dinghy rooms. My wife Kate was about to reap the reward she deserved for keeping her distance from my lowly friends in the past. I was cleaning up the master bedroom. That evening, I just washed the bathroom floor. I decided to just throw out the bedding and made a mental note to buy a new rug for the bedroom. Torn curtains will also have to be removed. I tried to stay busy, avoiding thoughts. This process was not helped by constant phone calls and knocking on the door. Yes, the media was in feeding frenzy mode. The combination of adultery and a guy having his manhood bitten off was a story sent from heaven to him. I opened the door only once and soon turned off the phone. Finally, with nothing to distract me, I began to do some soul-searching. Do I regret what I did? Strange, but no. I hated cheaters with a passion. I've seen too many guys turn into women when they catch their partners. The funny thing is that even before lunch, I was ready to bet my life on the fact that my wife shared this passion. I was stunned that I was so wrong. Not to mention I was completely taken aback by Kate's motivation. She seemed to be as devoted to me as I was to her, and our sex life was absolutely wonderful. Well, until recently, that was the case. After several hours of inner turmoil, I could only find one single clue. I remembered how the hairs on the back of my neck stood up two months ago when Kate announced that she was retiring to enjoy her last days of freedom. I expected her to work until at least the seventh month of pregnancy. Something about her saying she wanted one last hooray before having kids struck me as odd. My thoughts were interrupted by the ringing of my personal cell phone. Few people knew this number. Caller ID showed it was Kate's parents' number. They lived in the same state, but about three hours away. I always got on fantastically with them, so I answered. After much less of the usual pleasantries, her mother got down to business. Dave, what's going on? Do you know why a bunch of journalists are besieging our house? Well, they'll have to find out someday. I just couldn't bring myself to go into detail. Mom, did you watch the local news this evening? 
may be the main news. What? About some cheater who bit off her lover's dignity? I always liked her mom's colorful language and her views on life. But damn, it didn't make our conversation easy. Yes, mom. Look, there's no easy way to say this, so I'll get straight to it. The woman's name is Kate. Luckily, my confusion was interrupted by a scream, followed by a beep. When I pressed the end call button on my phone, I noticed a warning on the screen. This reminded me that I wrote down the end of my marriage just eight hours ago. I had vague memories of leaving my phone recording outside my bedroom door. I knew that if I never knew or believed the reason why Kate did what she did, I would never be able to trust any woman again. There was a good chance that I would die a lonely misogynist, doomed to a life of uselessness. With desperate hope, I started playing the video. I already knew what it was showing. The pain was too fresh to relive the scene. I opened my eyes just as I put the foam on the floor, without a visual representation, just a view of the hall ceiling. I had to imagine Mr. and Mrs. Adultery lying side by side on the bed. I couldn't hear the sound clearly, so I downloaded the file to my computer and ran it through an amplifier. This is an important part of their conversation. Wow, Kate, it was fantastic. Last week has been great, actually. Does this really have to end today? My offer still stands. Just give me your word, and I will divorce Sarah and marry you. Well, yes, it looks like it will work. A great start to a marriage with a guy who left his wife and kids. No, and I love Dave too much to hurt him like that. In addition, he is a great husband and will be a good father. After today, I will be Mrs. Goody Goody, a housewife, at least until the youngest of our children starts school. You can't love him that much. It's not him lying here next to you. No, you're mistaken. I love him very much. The moment I met him, I knew he was my only soulmate. I will never meet another. We are very much in tune sexually. I am happy that I have such a good man who spoils me and will nurse me when I get a big belly from his two or three babies. No, I want nothing more than to die in his arms, surrounded by our grandchildren. Well, that was a great speech, but it begs the obvious question, why are you with me now? At least Kate had the humanity to think about it. There was silence for a good half a minute. I guess I just missed the past. I didn't get married until I was 31 and was a bit of a wild girl. I missed just walking into a bar and getting attention from all kinds of guys. The thrill of leading a guy forward and then impulsively deciding whether he gets what he wants or not. Lately, Dave has been deer hunting with his buddies every other weekend. Three weekends ago, I decided to take a trip down memory lane and check out a bar. This resulted in one night that was okay but unsatisfying. Then last Saturday, I happened to walk into the bar you were at, and here we are. God, you're so cold, Kate. Just consider this the last hooray. Anyway, what are you complaining about? Come here. I said it had to end today. I didn't say it had to end right now. I turned off the sound. At least now I knew that I was a good lover and husband. The problem wasn't me. The following days passed in complete disappointment. Two days later, the reporters demobilized and left my quiet street. The hospital administrator called me and said that Kate would like some pajamas. I missed this one. She will have to put up with these humiliating hospital gowns. Two days later, her father called me. He apologized for his daughter's behavior and expressed hope that I would keep in touch with him. To try to sweeten the deal, he reminded me that he has another daughter and she was recently divorced. Sorry, Dad, it's just too weird. Four days after this event, he was shown on the news again. Mr. Not-So-Big Dick has been released from the hospital. Journalists dug up something and exposed him as a serial cheater. So it was with some pleasure that they announced that, although the surgeons had succeeded in sewing his manhood back together, it was very unlikely that it would achieve any of its intended functions. At the end of that week, I received an unexpected visitor. Mrs. Barton, or Sarah, as she insisted I call her, was a pretty lady with sad eyes. She told me that she had heard rumors that I might have some evidence that could help her in her divorce case. I explained that maybe it was true, but I couldn't admit it without exposing myself. She understood everything and was very apologetic for asking. 
I told her that I thought there was such an abundance of circumstantial evidence that she wouldn't need what I had. If this turns out to be wrong, I will persuade her to return and perhaps change her mind. There was such sadness in her that I felt sorry for her. Pulling out the video file, I played her only in the aftermath of the big explosion. The shock of her husband's screams made her cower at first, but she soon pulled herself together. Suffice it to say that she was not very sad when she left. Being the helpful guy that I am, I invited her to come pick me up when the sadness returned. Yeah, that wasn't the last time I saw Sarah Barton. The last visitor I received was probably the strangest. On Saturday, I answered the door to the detective I had spoken to at the house on the day of the big event. The suit disappeared, leaving only jeans and a shirt. Hey, son, no, I won't come in. I just wanted to say that if there was insufficient evidence, I recommended that the case be closed. Hearing my gratitude, he turned to leave, but stopped and looked back. Listen, at the end of the year, I will retire. If I come back after this, will you tell me how you did it? I just smiled and wished him a good day. Kate's letter arrived the following Tuesday. My dear Dave, I can't express how ashamed and sorry I am that I did this to you. I understand perfectly why you couldn't bring yourself to visit me, and I forgive you unconditionally. I never thought about the full extent of the possible consequences of my actions. I, of course, did not imagine that my parents would actually disown me. I know that I have lost your love, trust, and respect forever, which hurts me more than I can describe. I will understand if you never want to talk to me again, but it may help your recovery if you allow me to explain why I did what I did. Just be sure that it's all my fault. Doctors say that I won't be able to speak normally for a long time, if at all. They think I swallowed the tip of my tongue when I bit it off. They tell me about some experimental stretching technique that can restore some function. I hope this works, and I can at least get back to my career as a distraction from the dull, loveless, childless future I'm currently facing. Ask anything you want in a divorce, and I will sign it. If you could find it in your heart to keep me on your health insurance for the near future, I would be forever grateful. Farewell, my love. I wish you nothing but happiness in the future. I hope I haven't completely ruined your life. Your Kate, Aka, your cheating wife. I must say that the letter touched me so much so that I immediately reversed my previous decision and sent her pajamas to the hospital. Now where are Mick and Pete's phone numbers? Do I owe them a beer? A keg each. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.